time God is good. All right, we, we are getting this live stream because I've got some pastor friends that have been wanting uh, this information that I've been teaching you for a few weeks on leadership. And I uh, appreciate Brother Gerald taking the class with you guys and combining last week. We'll have tonight. We'll do next week. Next week will be the third. Correct? Does anybody know what we're doing after class next week? We're shooting fireworks and we're having an ice cream social. Man, who does not want ice cream in the heat of July? And the ministry's providing everything, all the toppings, all the fixings. All you got to do is show up. I'll, I'll do my last session on this leadership series. I, I've enjoyed being able to do it with you guys and, and go through the information together. And I hope that it's been a blessing to you. And I hope that you've gleaned some insight. On, on what leadership is, its influence, how God's looking for servant leaders. God blesses servant leaders. God promotes servant leaders. And some of the information I've given you on the handouts from the PowerPoint sheets, we, some of it, we hit on it briefly. So I would encourage you, anytime you get something like that, folks, let it be a resource to you. Keep it handy somewhere down the road. Take it out. Look over it again later. And uh, just let it be a blessing to you. Okay? Now, tonight you have a handout that says people become real leaders because of. Now, we may get to that tonight. We may not because I've got some other things that I want to just share my heart on. Can I do that? Because to me, I think leadership is very important. John Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership. And I believe that. Um, there, there are two types of folks that are going to be in an organization in, in capacities of what we call leaders. Okay, first, there is a manager. Second, there's a visionary. Now, the manager is a type of leader that just a manager can take a system or an organization. It's not just church. Y'all understand some of the principles. Most of the principles I'm giving you, you can put to work in your workplace. All right? But uh, I'm coming at it also from a church perspective. So a manager takes a system that is already developed by a visionary, and a manager keeps that system running, okay? He keeps sure that people are running the machinery, that the machinery is oiled, that, that the production level is up. So a manager runs where it's at. Now, a manager, a good manager, is good at running it where it's at, and is happy running it where it's at. And if it never goes beyond that, he or she is totally agreeable with that. That's good because their job, their gifting, their personality is to run it. And run it well. Keep it running and keep it running good. A visionary leader, folks, he or she sees somewhere that the company or the organization or the ministry is not, but it really needs to go there. In order for it to be better, in order for it to be more productive, it needs to go from where it's at. And though where it's at may be good, but in order to secure tomorrow and to stay ahead of the game, so to speak, Ahead of the competition. If you're in a corporate business, it may be a competitor that makes the same product or does the same type of work you do. Or if you're in an office, it may be somebody that, that has another business that's in competition with your business. If you're in church, we're not competing with other churches. And, and really, it should be this way, but we're competing with the devil. We're trying to get people out of a life of sin and out of a life of bondage and walking in the liberty that God's called them to, Right? And how many would agree what we're serving is a whole lot better than what the devil's serving? So, uh, you know, so we can have managers that are very good at, at keeping the church going, but we really need leaders to say, how can we get on the cutting edge? You know, a manager will, will, will keep a church going where it's at, but a visionary, a leader, a visionary leader is going to be sensitive to God. What new areas of ministry do we need to birth here? That's going to not just impact the people where we are, but how can we birth something that can impact people where we are not yet? Now, uh, my personality is, is I can do management, but my personality is more I want to go somewhere we're not yet. Amen? I want to birth stuff. I, 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 want, to, I want to see what we've got increase and be more productive. But I also want to see us do areas of ministry to touch people that we aren't even touching yet. And I think we need both. If you've got everybody in a church or an organization that's a visionary leader, you're not going to get anything done where you are. 
But if you've got everybody that's just a manager type leader, then you're going to stay where you're at. 40 years later, somebody's going to come back and you're still doing the same thing. Putting band-aids on the same machinery. I want to go somewhere. How many of y'all want to go somewhere? And if the kingdom of God is continually advancing, if it's perpetual, if it's always increasing, then we've got to have both. We've got to have both to maintain where we are, but we've got to have people that's going to see and people that are going to be hungry and help birth something for the future. Amen? So look at your neighbor and say it takes teamwork. teamwork. Now, I want to share some things with you tonight because we're talking about leadership. And uh, y'all let me know if you can see this. Integrity. How many of y'all believe integrity is important? If you look up the word integrity, if you go back to its, uh, I think, Latin origins, integrity means wholeness, all right? For example, any Star Trek fans? Star Wars? Anybody? Thank you. I got two. I got three. I got to get 40, 40, 40, 40. Anybody? Four and a half. <laughs> Undecided. But anyway, here's the thing. How many of y'all have ever seen one of the starships or one of the battleships or if you like a war movie and it's an a aircraft carrier or, or a, a, it could be a ship on the water and if they're under attack, they will say that our, the integrity of our hull has been jeopardized. Basically means that you've been hit hard and you're about, your, your airship or your boat, your ship is about to break apart. Okay? The structure has been cracked. All right, so integrity means wholeness. It means everything is together. Now, integrity, folks, in leadership is pivotal. I want you to lean over, high-five your neighbor, say, integrity in leadership is pivotal. Now, if y'all remember a few weeks ago, I told you that a position, that true leaders are not looking for position, but position is always looking for true leaders. Because, see, you can be given a position of leadership. You can be put somewhere by a man or a woman or a team or a group or a board. But how many of you know that, that if you don't have the integrity to stay there, you're going to mess your own self up with that position? How many of y'all ever seen that? I mean, how many of y'all ever seen somebody be given a promotion? And Now, here's the frustrating part of that. The frustrating part of that, folks, is when you're in relationship with somebody that is lacking integrity, you know it. And most of the time, how many of y'all remember when, when uh, David's oldest brother, remember when Samuel the prophet went down to Jesse's house in Bethlehem to, to ordain, to anoint the next king, and Eliab, David's oldest brother, walked in, and this guy was so good looking. I mean, he had such a, a presence, you know, like they say in, in, in the... Uh, entertainment world that a person has stage presence that they walk in the room and the whole room lights up. Well, Eliab had such a presence, folks, that when he walked in the room, Samuel just reached over for the bottle, the, the horn of anointing oil, and said, this, this has got to be it. This is the man. Who, who remembers what God said? Exactly. God said, stop. He said, you're looking on the outside. He said, but I'm looking at the heart. Now, folks, unfortunately, we still have men and leaders, men and women, in leadership positions that still look at people on the outside. And they're looking at their giftings, they're looking at their looks, they, they hear the way they talk, and they're like, oh my goodness, this person isn't, this is a natural. Well, and unfortunately, when it comes to leadership and integrity, we shouldn't be looking for a natural. We should be looking for a supernatural. Because here's the frustrating thing. When, when you are in an organization and you know somebody and you know that they're gifted, but you know them enough, you've been around them enough, you know they lie, they cuss, they'll steal. You know that they're void of integrity areas. And then when they get promoted, how many of you have ever sat down shaking your head and said, this ain't going to work? When I was in Charleston, I had been there for a few years and, and uh there was a young guy came to town, and, and he started a church. I had been there two or three years. I forgot, somewhere around three or four. And uh, so this young guy comes to town. He starts a church and, and started out with a handful of people, and like a year blew up to 150. 
Well, the reason it blew up to 150 is because he was going and stealing people from other people's church. And the only bad thing about it, how many of y'all know in towns there are people that have reputations for, for, let's just call it what it is, church hopping. They go from church to church to church to church. Well, he amassed himself 150 church hoppers. And then went to buy a piece of property to put these 150 people in at the tune of like $1.6 million. And, and I tried to form a relationship with this young man. He was a little bit younger than I was. And, you know, I'd been pastoring a few years, more than he had. And uh, so he called me over to look at this property. Their parking lot would probably hold 20 people. And, and that's the first thing I'm like, you, you're landlocked, man. You're going to spend all this money on this piece of property. Well, lo and behold, he got his denomination to come in and foot the bill to co-sign because to them, this guy was the next up-and-coming Joel Osteen. Well, they got in that building, and about six months later, guess what happened? Everything fell apart. And this guy, his marriage fell apart. He hit the eject button on the church and uh, left, left that. And uh, I forgot thousands of dollars a month mortgage to about 30, 40, 50 people that remained. And that just continued to dwindle, dwindle, dwindle his denomination ended up with a piece of property that they had to sell at a substantial loss. And I was sitting there the whole time shaking my head saying, this is not going to work. This is not, this is because I knew. First of all, this young man, he had too much pride. He was trying to build his name and not the kingdom. Now, was I being judgmental? Nope, not at all. You know, like I said, I spent try, time with him. I tried to encourage him to do things differently. But folks, look, when you are in leadership position, integrity has got to be something that's always got to be there. Do you understand that? Another thing about integrity, it means integrity, if you're going to be a leadership and ha in leadership, a leader and have integrity, that means you're going to be a team player. That means you're not out for your name to be all this and that. You're not out for your area of ministry. If it's ministry, if you're working for a corporation, you're not out for your, your part of the corporation to be all high and mighty so everybody's going to get your picture. In other words, you don't want to be the poster child of success. What you want to do is you want to be successful, but you want to be a team player in the organization that you're part of, and you want God to bless you because you want people to see what God's doing and you, not what you're doing for yourself. Now, here's the thing. If you want to get this, if you can't be a team player, don't expect people to flock to your team. I'll give you, I'm going to talk a lot from my heart. And I'm gonna, some of y'all watching this on video might get mad. You'll be all right. I'll sleep well tonight anyway. But it's like myself. I was at camp meeting. Went down there Sunday night, Monday, last night, came back today. And uh, it amazed me. I sat there yesterday, and uh, Brother George Cashel gave a great uh, message to ministers on integrity, which is kind of sad that your bishop has to get an older man to speak to your ministers in your conference on integrity. You would think that would be a given, right? Unfortunately not. Because how many of y'all watched the news lately or read the news lately? Uh, some guy up in Spartanburg just last week I was reading the news and uh, uh, an apostle in Spartanburg got arrested for having sex with two minor girls in his church and at his home. How I many you know that don't float the boat? And it's not just apostles. We had an IPHC pastor in a country church in the low country got arrested for molesting two young girls. Now, folks, that's sad. Now, you would think that that's a given, that we've got to be men and women of integrity if you're going to be in ministry. I would think we should understand we've got to be men and women of integrity if we're going to get into heaven. Now look, I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect and we're not going to have faults and we're not going to have failures. And I'm not saying there's not going to be temptation or weaknesses. They are going to be there. But how many of y'all know there's some stuff we've got to work through? And, and by and large, there's some stuff you're not going to work through by yourself. In fact, you want to write a nugget of wisdom down? If you could fix your problems, it wouldn't be a problem tonight. Yeah. My wife was counseling somebody the other day. She shared with me, and, and y'all don't know who they are. So don't worry, it's not you. <laughs> but she was saying, she shared with somebody, and they were saying, I, I've, got to, I've got some things in my life I've got to straighten out. I've got to get some things fixed before I can proceed in my, my walk with God. And I said, well, you need to tell that person if they could fix it, it wouldn't be a problem today. 
How many of you know God is our only source? And we need to lean on Him. So when it comes to integrity, I was saying this about the ministers, though, that I sat there, and, and we've got, Pastor Ben, was it like six or 700 licensed and ordained ministers in our conference? Marsha, Teresa, isn't there something like that when we have the, the big cadoodles, you know, with the big, all the people come in? <laughs> Whatever that thing's called. Yes, when we have a conference session. Now, when you have a regular business session every three years, you have a good turnout. We have, what, 300? Now, you got 700 licensed and ordained ministers. You have a business, all day business session, you'll have 300 something show up. That's including the delegates. But, Bo, when it comes voting time, they're all coming out the woodwork. You ain't seen them in three years, but they're coming to vote, bless God, because that's my right. So, yesterday, while I'm in this session, when the ministers are there to, for Brother Cashwell, the ministers that are there for the week for camp meeting, and there's probably all of a hundred in this big giant tabernacle. So I sat there and I got to thinking, you know what? If, if you can't play team ball, don't expect people to flock to be in on, on your team. So you know what? When the ministry, this ministry is doing something, we need to understand Am I a leader? Well, I think when we started this thing out, we, we kind of laid down the law. Everybody is a leader. Just because you don't have a title or a responsibility does not mean you're a leader. You exert influence. Leaders exert influence. Well, Pastor Tim, I don't have anything. You know what? If you come on this campus and you hug a neck, you shake a hand, you look at somebody and smile and say, it's good to see you today, what have you just done? You have just exerted influence. So look at two people and say, you are a leader. Now, this is, this is why I'm going to get into a little heavy stuff here in just a minute, all right? Sometimes integrity requires transparency. I wholeheartedly believe in being a transparent leader. I'm going to say that again. I wholeheartedly believe in being a transparent leader. For example, if you're a leader and you're in a position, you have somebody that comes to you, even if it's your home. You know, there are times you got to look at your kids and grandkids and you got to say, do such and such. When they say, why? You say, because I said so. And that should be good enough. But there are going to come seasons in life that you're going to address an issue that needs to be done. And they're going to look at you and ask why. And you've got to be able to give an answer. And it's not just because I said so. You need to be able to explain yourself. And if you're going to be a leader that's going to be transparent, you need to be able to explain yourself if somebody comes to you. Now, I had somebody t tell me a few weeks ago that, that their leader, that they couldn't go to their leader and ask them questions because their leader would get an attitude, get mad, because they felt like their authority was being questioned. I said, well, you got a bad leader then. Because, look, if you come to me and ask me a question that you're sincere about, and if I cop an attitude, that means i got something to hide. Or it means I'm insecure about something already. But if you come and ask me something, and if I have prayerfully given time to something, and I've got a word from God or a direction, what I feel to be a direction from God, I'm not just making a decision based on today's results. I'm making a decision that's based on tomorrow's results and next week and next month and next year. So if you come to me and ask me, why are we doing such and such? Why do we need such and such? Why, why did you do such and such? Then you know what? I should be able to sit down to you just like I am right now talking and I raise my voice, and I should be able to lay out to you why we do what we do. That's what transparency comes in leadership. Amen? Now, hold on now, hold on. Y'all don't let me lose you. Because I know some folk, some folk think, well, I honor the pastor. I, I'm not going to question. You know, it gets back to the old, when I was little, they used to say, if you question God, you're going to hell. Like you asking God why, is going to intimidate God? In fact, Habakkuk chapter 2, he says, I'm going to sit here and wait until God answers. And then God answers. He says, write the vision, make it plain so that they may run that read it. And then he goes on and God says, though it tarry, wait for it. It will not tarry. Now, I went through a season of my life. I looked for what appeared to be discrepancies in the Bible. And I didn't go to find discrepancies. I went to show why there were not discrepancies. So when I found the word Terry, he says, though it Terry, 
wait for it, for it will not tarry. Well, that's like God couldn't make his mind up, right? Is it tarrying or is it not? So I looked up the word tarry in the Hebrew, and the first word for tarry is not the word we think of tarry meaning procrastinate. It'll be put off. He said, no, it tarry. That word in the Hebrew means a word that it will be delayed while you ask interrogative questions. In other words, God said, there's some things that I'm not going to release into your life until you come to me and you ask the who, what, why, where, when, and how. Interrogative questions, like a report. In other words, God said, there's some things I want to unlock in your life. He said, but until you come to me and ask the right questions so you will have the answers to know what's coming to pass, I'm not going to let that go. So he said, though it tarry, wait for it, it will come to pass it shall not tarry that last word for tarry is the word we think of in procrastinate when God's going to release something in your life it's going to come and it's going to come like that it's not look folks the question is not is God ready for it the question is God has God got us ready for it amen look at your neighbor ask him has God got you ready for it so transparency now so a leader should be able to be transparent but let me swing this around. There's another side of that coin. There are times that a leader's transparency can only go so far. For example, I'm going to give you for example, and I'm, I'm going to walk through this for a little bit. If somebody is dismissed from a position in ministry, you know, whether it be a, a, a paid position or whether it be a, a position in, in, in an area of ministry, one of the arms of the ministry, you got to understand that you're not going to know all the details all the time. Are we together? Okay. So, first thing is, if integrity is a matter, you got to understand that a leader is never going to make a decision to dismiss somebody unless there are legitimate reasons to do so. All right? How many of y'all ever worked a job? You know, most people don't read the book of Job because they think it's a job. Now, how many of you have ever been on a job place to work for somebody and somebody else got fired? How many of y'all ever had to fire somebody? That's not a fun thing, is it? And how many of you know you just don't wake up one morning and go to work and somebody rubs you wrong one time and you say, you're fired. You don't do that, do you? First thing is, if you're going to do it properly and legally, you better have a paper trail. In other words, it's just not a one-time thing that you made me mad, now you're fired. I'm having a bad day. You can't do that, man. People take you to court, especially nowadays. They might sue you for looking at them wrong, right? So you got to do things. you got to do it in order. Are we together? So you got to understand when it comes to transparency with a leader and, and integrity is involved, that when somebody's been dismissed, I, I've got basically five reasons that a leader will dismiss somebody. Number one is belligerence. Belligerence toward a leader or supervisor. Belligerence. You ever worked with somebody that was belligerent? They argue, they complain. They're negative, and instead of them helping promote your organization, they're a weight. Have you ever had somebody that you worked with that was belligerent and everybody tried everything they could to help that person get, could we say, on board, but it was just their personality, and they just could not submit to somebody? Anybody ever had that? All right, number two, insubordination or failure to comply. I had to fire a praise and worship leader in Charleston. And I love this guy like a son. But he got it where he wouldn't do praise and worship. He wouldn't have to pray. Praise him, come praise. Love the guy. Loved him like a son. Took money out of my own pocket. Tried to bless him abundantly, financially, and in capacity. Tried to work through this stuff. But it finally got down to the point that he looked at me and told me no. Old preacher cuss rose all up inside of me. I ain't gonna lie. You know, and it just got to the point that I had, I had to bring one of the elders in. We sat down and, 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 uh, and it got kind of heated, you know, because, look, my thing is after I put a whole lot into you, I pour into you, take out of my own family's money and put into you, I, I'm expecting some dividends. And then to be treated like that, to be talked to like I'm subservient or something like that, no, baby, that, 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 uh, 
rebellion stuff don't go good with me in that capacity. So eventually, it just came to the point. I said, this is not working. So therefore, we, we're going to have to work something out. So he was terminated. And on his termination papers that I put in the file of that ministry, he was terminated for insubordination. How many of you know it ain't good when you look at your boss and say no? Just when they're asking you to do your job. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all look at the boss and they expect you to do your job and say no? But how many of y'all ever had your boss to tell you to do something you didn't like and you still said yes, sir, or yes, ma'am? Yeah, because you understand the line of authority. Number three, number three, a reason a person may be uh, released from a position or dismissed is a lack of effort. You ever had anybody lazy that you work with? No, y'all hadn't had it. Number four, inability to perform. How many of y'all know that some folks, they got to want to, they just can't? I mean, come on. If, if you got somebody that gets hired to sit beside you in an office position and their job is to do something on a computer but they don't even know what a mouse is, how many of you know we got a problem? Right? So if they have the inability to perform, well, somebody may have made a poor decision. And you know what? Sometimes we leaders make poor decisions and we're expecting more than somebody can perform. But when it comes time and it comes down to it, we got to look and say, hey, we need to fix this. And number five, and this is from a ministry aspect here. One ministry aspect that we need to understand is tithing. Tithing is very important. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to be in a capacity, in a capacity of leadership in this ministry, you need to be a tither. And if and when it is brought to my attention that that's not the case, then we'll address it lovingly. But if that person is not willing to line up, because how many of y'all know if the anointing flows down and if somebody is not tied, how many of y'all know God said you're cursed with a curse? So then if I'm allowing somebody to stay in a position, then the people that serve under them, I'm basically asking God to let a curse flow from the person over them down in that area of ministry. I, yeah, this is too heavy for y'all tonight, isn't it? See, leadership isn't always the limelight on Sunday morning with a microphone, folks. If you're going to be a leader, sometimes you've got to know the capacities of ministry or your organization. That, look, if there are some things, if you are going to be promote, promoted to a supervisory or a boss position where you work at, and you know somebody's breaking your company rules, it is your responsibility to deal with it. Or at least bring it to light to somebody that it is their responsibility to deal with it. If you know it and you're going to be a leader, your integrity says you've got to address it. Boy, it's quiet in this Holy Ghost field teaching tonight. The integrity of the leader, listen now, if these five things, any of these five things are in effect, the integrity of the leader moves then to maintain the integrity of the organization. If everything rises and falls on leadership, and if we have a poor leader in a, in a position that is non-producing or detrimental to, detrimental to the entire organization, then it becomes the upper leadership's responsibility to deal with that area. And though that's not something that we wake up in the morning and say, who do I get to get on to today? No. But it is our responsibility that if there's an area that is not producing after a period and a season of praying for God to give us wisdom, First of all, my personal thing is, if I've got somebody that's got an issue, that's having issues with other people in the ministry, or, or they're doing something that, that, now listen, if it's immoral, illegal, or unbiblical, we have to get in there swiftly and deal with it. But if this is just a personality clashing going on, and this belligerence is because there's, there's just some butt heads going on, well, first of all, I start praying. I start praying for the person involved that has the attitude, that has the bad spirit, I start praying for the leader that they're butting heads with, for God to give them wisdom and grace and how to deal with it. But how many of you know that you can't pray for six years for something that should be swiftly changed? And if you sit down and have a counseling session with somebody and you give them a list of 12 things, work on these things, please, it'll make you a better person. It'll make your area of ministry better. And if you do that twice in six months and then you come back and you still not made any progress and you understand we got a problem that's not getting fixed here. So we need to make a change.
That's where a lot of people don't want to be. That's where the official church board looks at me and says, you the man. So look at your neighbor and say, for the sake of the organization and the future, sometimes things have to be dealt with that we don't like. Now, again, on a personal level, I can assure you that I don't just wake up looking for people that I can drop a hammer on. For those of you that know me, you know I'm not a drop the hammer kind of guy. If I got to handle business, if I got to take care of a situation, I'll do that. But I don't wake up in the morning seeing who I can be mean, rude, and crude to. All right, now I'll jump in the foxhole with you and fight the devil off in a heartbeat. And if somebody's messing with you or your kids, you call me. I had a friend of mine say he was in Walmart parking lot. I think it was over here at Red Bank yesterday. And, uh, uh, well, a nice gentleman and his pregnant wife or girlfriend came out. And he grabs her by her hair in the parking lot, gets in her face, yanks her head back, and starts screaming in her face. Now, my friend is uh, an ex uh or what they call it, recon, marine, sniper. He could kill this boy before that boy knew he was hitting the ground dead. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I said, man, I, I was saying, I'm glad I'm not there because I can't handle a man hitting on a woman. Now, in that case, I would be rude and crude. Y'all, somebody can pay my bail. I just want to be sure before I get in trouble. But, but look, folks, when it, when it comes to leadership, I'm not looking for folks that are in the ministry that I can just go be mean to. But how many of you know sometimes when you have to be stern and you've got to be fatherly, how many of you know sometimes when you spank your children, they think you're mean? They thought you're the meanest person ever on the face of the earth. But why did you spank them? Because they needed to be disciplined. Because you knew that you needed to take care of a situation that was going to make them better in the long run. How are we doing here? Okay. Now, once... We have repeated episodes of these one of these five points, belligerence, insubordination, lack of effort, inability, or if you're working in a corporate setting, you're going to be in leadership. Those are your four main things that you've got to be looking for. You've got to deal with those things in leadership. In ministry, it's the lack of tithing is included, all right? But once it's evident by, evidence by repeated episodes that the five-point list from above, that that person cannot or will not be an effective team player, then a leader's got to do something. Okay? Y'all thought I was going to give y'all five points to be a better leader, huh? I'm trying to let you know. Look, if we're going to go from a small church to a large ministry, you got to understand there are going to be internal issues that have to be dealt with. Some of you are going to be in position. You're going to be in, in, in a one-on-one -on -one relationship and capacity with those folks, and you are going to probably sometimes be the buffer, the first line of buffering to try that, that, that we may say, would you talk to such and such? Some of y'all ready to run out of church right now, I can tell. I wasn't ready for all this up in here. All right, now, here's the thing. Here's what you've got to be careful of. Are you ready? If you're having to deal with somebody that is manifesting any one of these five things in their life, all right, on the outside, everybody else, this person, remember, people look on the outside. This person may look like they are... You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then them. So when you go and have to address an issue with them individually and personally, and especially if they get dismissed from an area of ministry, then there's other people that have held them up on a pedestal. They're going to think you are Satan incarnate. Hello. So, you know what the problem with that is? Those people that are looking on the outside are not aware of all the details. They're not aware of all the details. Touch your neighbor and say they're not aware of all the details. Now, transparency. This is where you have to draw the line. Everybody say confidentiality. That's something that everybody, every person under the sound of my voice should hold in the highest regard is confidentiality. If somebody comes to talk to you, you don't need any spread, spread. Thank you. Even our men's group, MQ, when we started, and it is a standing understanding that whatever we talk about in that room when we meet, it stays in that room. And I told them from the first day we met, if we discuss something, if, if one man discusses something that he's struggling with, and if it gets out, I will track the source down personally. 
Because to me, folks, confidentiality is the highest thing. To me as a pastor, confidentiality is the highest thing. You can ask my wife. There have been people that have come and confided stuff to us that, that have died and gone on to Jesus. And we have never, it's never part of our lips to come out of our mouth. All right? Now, now there is one thing in South Carolina, you're a court-mandated reporter. So if somebody comes and, and uh, they confess to a crime or somebody comes and says that they've been abused uh, excuse me, sexually, uh, you have to report that. If not, you can go to jail. But if somebody comes and talk to you about stuff, yes, and if they, if they say, I've been contemplating suicide or I've attempted suicide, you've got to make somebody aware of that. All right? But when it comes to transparency, folks, this, this is something we've got to understand. All right? Are you ready? Integrity and in leadership prevents a leader from making the details known because of confidentiality. I'm, I'm going to give you two examples here. Y'all know I'm, I'm in relationship and I mentor a lot of young pastors. And uh, I had one call me just about three weeks ago. Are you ready for this? Y'all not ready for this. This is, if anybody thinks church is boring, they confused, man. There's more stuff going on in churches than all my children, the young and the restless days of our lives. Are they still on? I don't know. I'm just calling a name. I don't know. But, I mean, there's more stuff going on in church than in soap operas. Y'all know what I'm saying? Okay, so I got this young pastor. He calls me, and he says, Pastor, well, they call me Bishop. That's not something I asked them to. That they just all called me that. I think it's, we, Kim and I were talking about that last night because everybody at camp meeting was calling me Bishop. And, and she said, where did it come from? I said, well, I think Chuck Marino called me that first. But then it dawned on me all the way back in Rockingham. Bishop Amos, who pastored up the road for me, he started calling me Bishop way back then. So if a bishop is a pastor to pastors, I guess that's what I am. So anyway, this young man calls me. He says, Bishop, he said, I got a problem. I need some, I need some, some wisdom. I need some, some insight. So he tells me that, that uh, he had a situation of two people in prominent positions in his church were having an affair. Now, granted, the fact that I said they're having an affair means they are not married to one another. One was in a very prominent front-line position. The other was on a position more uh, outside the sanctuary working around the grounds doing kind of things. Now, for the gentleman that was not front line, they came, they confided in the pastor. The pastor said, what do I do? I said, well, I think there's got to be, there's got to be some restoration that's going to take place. There's got to be a process. They've got to sit down and not be involved in, in any type of ministry for a certain number of months. That's up to you. And they need to come to counsel. If they don't submit to that, then their heart's not in the right place and you don't want them there. <coughs> well, guess what? The young man, when the pastor said you've got to submit to so many months of, of, uh, uh, of not being in position, just come in and receive, let people minister to you, let the Holy Spirit minister to you, you know, go to counseling with one of the associate pastors. The young man, guess what he said? Most definitely, I'll do that. That's commendable to me. The young woman who was in a frontline position in front of everybody during the service, she submitted to the same thing. But next, his question was, how do I address the congregation? Because they're going to know he was a head such and such. She was in a frontline position, and now both of them are sitting in the seat. And I told him, I said, and I'm not going to call his name, and you almost did. I said, <laughs> whew, almost slipped out. I said, the thing is, brother, you can't address that to the congregation. Because, see, there's two things about confidentiality. In integrity in ministry, there, there, there's one thing. You can't do it because you can't breach confidence. And the second reason a true leader can't tell all the details to the congregation is because, really, even if a person is at fault and we don't like it, it's still our job to cover their fault. Not to condone it. But it's not our job to broadcast what happened. Now, the converse side of that, I had another young man, another young pastor call me, 
and his associate pastor was having an affair with the praise and worship leader. Notice I said affair. That means also they were not married to one another. Now, flip the coin where the other couple submitted to the authority. And even though the pastor, and, and I, to my knowledge, everything is going smooth. Nobody's asked questions. These people didn't buck their authority. And how many of you know sometimes when people don't buck authority, that the congregation doesn't have to question why they're out? They know there must be a reason. And, and when the integrity of the leadership is maintained, you trust the leader. We'll get to that in just a moment. But now when the associate pastor came and confided that he and the praise and worship leader had been having an affair, the pastor looked at the young man, looked at him, he said, well, man, we, then, then, you know, I appreciate you coming and, and confiding in me, but we've got to work out a work of, of restoration. He said, what does that mean? He said, well, you're going to have to be out of ministry for so many months, and, and we've got to put you through counseling. Well, guess what this young man did? He said, heck no, man. I'm called to preach. I said, no, you're called to be holy first. Hello. Now, the problem with this young man is that you got two people, you got two different circumstances. you got a couple that were wrong, but they submitted to the authority of the leadership, and the leadership did not have to tell the church. This other guy that bumped it, he took his girlfriend, left his wife. She left her husband. They, whatever they are. But not only that, on the way out, they tried to hurt the church by telling people how judgy, hard, non-loving, and mean the leadership is at that church. And that's why we're leaving. And they tried to take people with them. So this pastor called me and said, what do I do? How do I address this? And I said, you can't. The only thing you can do is stand up and tell your church, I love you. I've been here long enough for you to know my character, my integrity. You know I'm not mean. You know I'm not judgmental. You know I'm a loving, compassionate, caring pastor. And regardless of what anybody has left this church has told you, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you trust me? And that's what you got to do in integrity. The acid test, folks, of integrity is credibility. Please get that. It's credibility. Now, I, I, I now hate Norman and Teresa McCurry. <clears throat> they got me hooked on this aggravating series of Downton Abbey. So, Kim, y'all know, Kim and I, we, I spoke at a church last Wednesday night. I was speaking at a church in Conway, and I was going to do a leadership training session that Saturday there. So, uh, you know, we were blessed to be able to spend a few days down at the beach where they gave us this, what is it, like a series episode of this Downton Abbey. Has anybody ever watched it? Don't watch it. It is addictive. I'm telling you, it's up the devil. <laughs> Now, y'all know I love old stuff, right? I mean, like, man, I go to Biltmore House and Gardens. I, I don't even want to go see the garden. I mean, y'all I love woodwork and stuff. And I just walk around in the Biltmore House. Man, I go in the bedroom and God hooked me up, man, with favor. Last time we were there, we went there late in the afternoon and it was almost closing time. There's nobody in there. And this little old man that works there had keys to all the rooms. Took me in rooms that you don't normally get to go in. Oh, man, I was like a kid loose in a candy store. So I love old stuff like this. So Downton Abbey is kind of set back in the early 1900s in that in a big place like that. They've got servants and all this stuff, you know. The valet. I thought it was funny. The valet. They call it the valet, right? These guys, the gentlemen, the gentlemen, they don't even put their coats on. They just walk up to the valet and turn around and hold their arms out. You know the valet puts his coat on. I need a valet. Get that. The country doesn't come to town, man. What? <laughs> now, here's the thing. There's a guy in there, the valet of the head guy, and I forgot his name. What's the name? Carl. Mr. Bates. Yes, Mr. Bates. Now, Mr. Bates has a past. All right? He's been in prison. And, and he's, he's gone to prison because his wife stole stuff, and he took the fall. 
And now he's hired by the, the rich, rich man who owns this whole big, giant castle-looking thing. That they were in, now I'm still catching up. Y'all don't give anything away. That day they were in the war together somewhere, in the military together. And so the, the big, rich man gives him a job, and he's his personal valet. In South Carolina, we call it valet. But now here's the deal. You ready? So he sees these people that are stealing stuff and doing all this undermining stuff. But Mr. Bates will not tell him. Even when he's confronted by his boss and he knows what the truth is, he will tell him, I cannot answer, sir. Now that was driving me crazy because I'm sitting there, Kim's about half asleep with her head on my lap, and I'm screaming, tell him, man. Tell him. Throw him under the bus. But see, he felt like he was in a position that he could not do that. And see, sometimes we are going to be in a position that just because we know something, we can't make that truth known to everybody at that time. There may come a time that it will happen, but we can't do it. Because here's the problem. That five-point list I gave you, the belligerence, the insubordination, uh, lack of performance, all these things, the majority of, uh, I look at those, three of the five of those are pride-oriented. Pride-oriented. Why does somebody want to fuss with their boss? Because they pride, got pride. Why does somebody insubordinate have the audacity to tell their boss, I'm not going to do my job? Because they're full of pride. Are we together? What is the number one thing? In the list of things that God hates, it's pride. Now here's what I've learned, folks. You better hear me well. Because if you're going to be a leader, you're going to come across people with pride. And once you put your finger on a spot they don't want you to touch, they're going to fire back at you. And if you ever have to get on to them to the point, if you ever have to dismiss them, a person that is full of their self will never leave quietly. They're always going to try to put you down on the way out. I wish it wasn't so, but it's so. So what they do is anybody that they can get their ear, they're going to go and give them their side of the story. But you know what common sense should tell us? There's always two sides to every story. I had a young pastor call me the other day. He was telling me about a situation. And uh, he asked, somebody had come to him and, and, and had confided in him about something that they had an alt against somebody else. They said it offended them or said something that was offensive. And uh, he said, what do I do? I said, have you talked to the other person? He said, no. I said, brother, look, don't ever forget, there's always two sides to every story. Now, look, so if anybody ever goes out and dogs you out because of a decision you made in a leadership position, whether it's in your house or whatever, and if they're upset with you or they're talking about you and they come and say something, you need to just look at it. You don't need to explain yourself because in this, sometimes you're not going to be able to confide in all the details. Sometimes all you got to say is there's always two sides to every story, and that's all I can say. How are we doing? Now, if you as a leader... You have to make a qualitative and quantity and a quality decision. Sometimes your integrity is going to be questioned. But folks, look, don't you get caught up in pride. You understand that? Because here's what pride is going to make you want to do. And I did not realize this was an issue because my thing is you've got to guard your integrity, okay? But you don't need to defend yourself. And I didn't realize this until I read uh, C. Peter Wagner's book on humility. But people that are always feeling like they've got to defend their decisions and defend when somebody disagrees with them, they got to show everybody why they're right. That's a pride issue. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a pride issue. Ouch! I know none of y'all like that are in here, right? We husbands and we wives, we need to be careful because sometimes that's a little pride issue. I gotta prove while I'm why I'm right. No. If you're in a leadership capacity, folks, whether it's a, a corporate job, a secular job, or you're in a leadership capacity in ministry, folks, look, there comes a time that you're gonna have to make a decision. Yes, your integrity is gonna be questioned, but you know what you gotta do? You gotta lay it on the altar of trust. 
and you've got to let your credibility be in play. Now, a leader with a bad reputation has no integrity. How many of you would agree with that? And you should not trust a leader with a bad integrity. I wrote down some things that are lack of, lack of credibility. Number one, a, a leader that lacks credibility lies. Lies. Now, I know y'all think that preachers don't lie. Oh, baby, hold on. They lie. I have a cousin. When I was a youth pastor, I have a cousin that lived across the street from the pastor. Across the street. He was unsaved. He's still unsaved. We had a scheduled appointment. Me and the pastor were going to go visit him at a certain time to witness to him. We had set it up several days in advance. Well, the pastor calls at the last minute. Well, it was about 30 minutes or so before said, I've had something come up. You're not going to be able to make that meeting. So I called my cousin. I said, we're not going to be able to come. The pastor's had something come up. He said, yeah, he sure did. I saw him getting in his car with his tennis rackets and his tennis bag and his tennis clothes on. That same pastor, well, we might as well be transparent while we're being transparent, huh? That same pastor, back in the day, when you got your license, they had a thing called missions worker's license. You would go down and meet the conference superintendent, and he would give you a missions worker's license, which was the first step of getting involved in the denomination. Then you got a minister's license, then you got ordained. So I was talking to this pastor at his wife's clothesline in his backyard. And my father-in-law had told me I needed to proceed to looking into getting my minister's uh, my missions worker's license. So I asked the pastor since I was working at his church. And he said, no, you can't get that. So I went and found out I could. So I went in his office and I asked him, why did you tell me that I could not? He, he laughed, chuckled. He said, I didn't tell you you could not. I said, man, we were standing at your, your, uh, your wife's clothesline. He said, no, I didn't say that. I leaned down on the front of his desk and I looked, looked him in the eye and I said, you're a liar. And I cannot serve in ministry under a liar. I wasn't ugly. I said it very calmly. But I said it very confidently. Leaders who lack credibility lie. Is this all right with y'all? Leaders who lack credibility are lazy. There's one thing between delegating and another thing between being lazy, y'all. Good leaders know how to delegate. But sorry leaders want everybody else to do them for them and they get all the credit. Good leaders know how to delegate and give credit. That's good stuff right there. Another thing about poor leaders, if they lack credibility, they're unfaithful in marriage. Another thing about leaders who lack credibility is they cannot sustain relationships. Another thing about a leader that lacks credibility is they go from organization to organization. Or if it's a, a, a ministry thing, a church thing, they go from church to church. They hop. They can't put roots down. Another thing about a leader who lacks credibility is they can't handle or can't swallow somebody disagreeing with them. Another thing about a leader who lacks credibility is they pout. And they have the kid with the new ball attitude. That is, if you don't play by my rules, I'm taking my ball and going home. Here's something good you can look at. I mean, see, folks, look, I'm just being real with y'all on some stuff. You're going to see some of this stuff down the line. If we're going to be a growing church, you're going to see it. The more people come in, the more we grow, the more people that get into areas of ministry. See, it's back to the thing of pulling back the layers. The closer we get to people, we're going to see them not just for their perks, not just for the good things, but for their bad things. And we want to help people work through the issues that they have and the character flaws, but some folk just ain't going to budge. Is this all right? Kid with a ball attitude. For example... All right, if I tell you I'm called to an area of ministry and you put me into a, a, a leadership position in that ministry 
And then for some one of these five reasons, if I can't perform, if I've got an attitude that's just continu continually repetitive, and if you have to dismiss, dismiss me, look, if I tell you I'm part of that, that area of ministry, I'm going to stay active in that area of ministry even if I'm not the big dog. Boy, this is where the rubber hit the road up in here. The last thing about a, a leader who lacks credibility is pride. Now, a leader who is proficient in care credibility, here you go. You ready? They're consistent. They've got a good marriage. They work a job continuously. They don't bounce from place to place to place. You ask some people for a resume, their, their uh, inkjet thing's going to run out of paper. And ain't nothing wrong with working a job till you find something better. When I was in college, man, I'd work one job, and look, if I'd been working it two weeks and somebody offered me more money, I'd work a notice there, and I'd take a better job. There's nothing wrong with that. But now look, if you're 50 years old and you're still going from job to job every two or three months, Houston, we got a problem. Relationships, consistency in relationships, got to be grounded. A proficient leader with credibility is always going to be a finisher. They're going to start what they finish. They're going to be a person of honesty. They're going to be a person of humility. They're going to be a person who holds confidentiality in the highest regard. They're always going to be looking for the best of the organization. And the last thing on this, if a person is going to be a leader of credibility, if they're going to be a leader of integrity, then guess what? They're going to have a servant's heart. They're going to have a whatever it takes mindset. You're never too big to pick up a broom. Never too big to swing a mop. Never too big to grab a trash bag and take a hike out to the dumpster. Amen? Never too big to help Pastor Betty get out of the dumpster. When you catch her, drive up, catch her dumpster dive. <laughs> Folks, look, I wanted to share this with you tonight because integrity, see, you're here and you're receiving teaching on leadership and integrity. Now that means that, that I'm giving you some insight, some wisdom, and some things that, that you need to absorb and you need to say, now, God, how can I be accountable with this stuff? How can I be accountable with this insight, with this integrity, these factors of integrity? Because look, Back to you Star Wars and Star Trek fans. Look, if the integrity of our hull has been breached, then we're about to blow up. Right? If the integrity of our hull has been breached, we're about to sink. And guess what? One of the main things you should always think of is that no matter come what may, I will maintain my integrity. In fact, the psalmist David said this. He said, my integrity will uphold me. And I can tell you this from example, folks. You can go through any situation. You can go through any situation. And if your integrity has been maintained. You know what I like about telling the truth? You don't have to remember what your lie was. I used to have an uncle, bless his heart. He, he's going on to be with Jesus now. But there was a season in his life. That when he was younger and I was a little kid, I used to love to listen to him. Because he would start telling you a lie. And you knew when he started adding to it because he started stuttering. You could talk to him the next week and he would start off with the same story. But when he got to the lie part, it was always a different part of the story. So the thing about telling the truth is, you don't have to remember which part is the truth and which part you made up. Because if you can live out the truth, the truth will always be with you. And the last time I read the Bible, it said the truth will set you free. Amen? Now, remember folks, this is not just about leadership in church. If God wants to bring you promotion, you're a leader where you are, but you're going to become a greater leader. You need to expect to become a greater leader. Now, in the last few weeks, I've been trying to give you tools in how to become a better leader. If you're not the big boss, one of the things I taught you was from the, the life of Eliezer in Genesis 24, how to be a boss under the 
All right, so you're already, if you're working your way up the ladder, some of y'all retired, some of y'all really, really looking for retirement, right, Mr. Marie? <laughs> and, you know, and here's the thing, but it doesn't matter where you are. In life, you're exerting influence in somebody else's life. Be a leader. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of character. Be transparent. Let people see you for who you really are. But when it comes time to maintain confidence, you just, you just got to stand there and you got to say, you, you got to trust me. If you can't trust me, I love you anyway. All right? But what I'm doing, I can't tell you why such and such has happened. You just got to trust me on this one. And if people know your heart, they're going to trust you. Like Miss Ann right there. I love that lady. She's awesome, isn't she? Yeah. Pay the but you know what? If she called me tomorrow and told me something, I would trust every word that came out of her mouth. I would, man. I remember when we first came down here and met with the church board. And I walked in with mom's wearing t-shirts and a short. And I said, shorts. I said, right now, I said, I like this guy. I didn't know he was crazy then. I just started interested in people. You know, and I sat in there and I talked with him. And, and Al Colbert and J.R., they're like brothers. They won't claim it, but somewhere down the line, they can. And, and those fellas started talking about this ministry. And they started to weep. They started to cry about it because they wanted God's will done in this church. being real, being transparent. Say, I can appreciate that. I don't do phony good and I don't handle phony good, but I love real people. Thank God for real people. Amen? If you're real and you thank God for it, just give Him a praise, alright? Thank God. Lord, thank you tonight for leaders. And I know this might not have been the, the rip-roaring, getting happy kind of stuff. But, Lord, this is some meaty stuff that we got to chew on. We're going to be a growing church. There are going to be issues down the line that we're going to have to jump over some hurdles and, and uh, maybe sometime jump through some flaming hoops. But, God, we also got to understand that, that you are the real leader. Like on this handout that I gave these folks tonight at Judges, when the people asked Gideon, be our ruler, Gideon said, nope, I won't do it, neither will my sons. But God is the ruler of this people. Lord, we acknowledge this is your ministry. And God, because this is your ministry, we want to welcome the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to have folks coming here that have got character flaws, that they're going to submit, they're going to let you buffer them, and they're going to let you mold them. And you're going to do that through relationship with us. But God, at the same time, we're not going to get some euphoric or utopia mentality thinking everybody's just going to come in here and be hunky-dory. But God, they're going to be some troublemakers from time to time. And we as a church need to understand that when we go through some turbulent times, that our leaders are maintaining character and integrity. We will be transparent. But in order to guard people, even in their wrong, in order to guard them, God, we are called to be mandated as such. So Father, I bless these folks tonight. I thank you for what you're doing at Crossroads Lord Outreach Center. I ask you, God, to make us greater leaders of greater impact. Increase our levels of responsibility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. By the way, Downton Abbey, they left the last DVD out of the set. <laughs> they dropped it off in my office box, and while I was packing my stuff up to take with us on the trip, I laid the DVD down and forgot it. So guess who was mad when they got to the last DVD and went to put the next one in and didn't have it? Pray for me. <laughs> All right. I love y'all. God bless you. I'm uh, glad to be a part of your lives and glad you're a part of mine. Y'all have an awesome rest of the week. Don't forget, we got uh, next Wednesday after class, we're going to be moseying over to the Ice Cream Social. We'll have fireworks. And then Friday on the 5th, you know, if anybody likes to ride motorcycles, they got one. We're going to have a motorcycle ride. We're going to leave here at 7, go get some breakfast. We're going to ride up to Lake Watery in Winsboro, come back here by lunchtime, and have lunch together. So y'all welcome to join us. God bless. If you want to go rent a motorcycle, feel free to do that. <laughs>